Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Julie White, the president of the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here and to introduce our Spring Birding Festival keynote speaker, Julia Zarankin. Julia is a writer, birder, birdsplainer, lecturer, and culture tour leader based in Toronto. Julia has an AB from Brown University and a PhD from Princeton, both in comparative literature. Her writing has appeared in such prestigious publications as Audubon, Canadian Geographic, The Walrus, Hazlitt, Antioch Review, Birding Magazine, The New Quarterly, and Ontario Nature. She was shortlisted for the CBC Short Story Prize in 2020, won the Eden Mills Writers' Festival Nonfiction Prize, has been first runner-up for PRISM International's Nonfiction finalist for the TNQ Edna Stater Personal Essay Contest, and twice longlisted for the CBC Nonfiction Prize. Julia's birding life aspirations are as follows, quote, to sport the hairdo of a cedar waxwing, acquire the wardrobe of a northern flicker, and develop the confidence of a Ross's goose. Julia's close identification with and passion for birds is why we're all here with her tonight. Julia is going to talk about her book, which, as she describes, quote, recounts my unlikely transformation from total nature novice to bona fide bird nerd. Field notes from an unintentional birder tells the story of the unexpected pleasures of discovering one's wild side and finding meaning in midlife through birds. I really liked Julia's book. One line in particular I felt summed up her attitude, quote, sometimes I joke that birds saved my life. And then I rephrase gave a new life, the one I never knew I needed, but exactly the one I wanted. I'm so pleased to hand this webinar over to Julia so we can find out more about the wild and meaningful life she's found through birds. There will be a question and answer at the end. Uh, please use the chat button and uh, Megan will uh, will manage that at the end. So over to you, Julia. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Julie. I am absolutely thrilled to be with you this evening. And thank you so much for taking, taking the time out of your spring migration schedule uh, to, join, to, to join me tonight to talk about my book. Um, I'm based in Toronto. So things, things are getting pretty exciting in, um, in terms of spring migration and um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. And so, you know, one of the greatest joys of being a writer is, of course, having readers. So um, I thank you for engaging with my book and engaging with my story. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I have some photos to share with you in just one second. OK, hold on. Just bear with me. Okie dokie. So this, uh, this is my book, Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder, and my presentation is called Birding from Passage to Passion. And um, this book that I wrote, this memoir, it was published uh, in the fall of 2020, so it's, uh, it's fairly new. Um, and it's a book about my midlife love affair with birds, and essentially it is a book about how birds taught me to see in a new way, how birds taught me to see the world with wonder. And here's a photo of me that my long suffering husband took. Uh, this is in Cape May, New Jersey, back in the days when we could still travel. And here I am looking at the world. Um, it is, it's only slightly staged, by the way. Uh, so yeah, this book is really about how birds taught me to see in a new way. And they really, in a sense, gave me a new, uh, a new lease on, uh, a new lease on life. Um, so let's, uh, let's see. What birds really taught me was um, 
how to observe the world closely and how to pay attention to my surroundings. And that in turn changed the way I interact with people um, and also just gave me a new way of being in, uh, in the world. So um, something, you should, something you should note is that my book is not at all ornithology. I'm not a scientist, I am a writer. And so very often I write about, um, you know, I assess avian coiffures and I write about birds' fashion sense. Um, you know, this, this, this book is not, is not science. Instead, it is a memoir of my own personal transformation. Um, and through birds, I also discovered nature. You know, the title of my book is Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder. And if somebody had told me 15 years ago that I would be that person, um, you know, running around sewage lagoons with my binoculars glued to my, uh, to my eyes, um, you know, waking up at four in the morning, I never in a million years would have believed them. I come from a Russian immigrant family. We came to Canada when I was three years old in the late 70s. And, you know, I, my parents are classical pianists. They're musicians. As a family, we didn't do nature. My mother always said, you know, we didn't emigrate from the Soviet Union to sleep in a tent. And she always said nature is for other people. So this book is also about my very belated acquaintanceship and love affair with nature as well because that is something i was not raised with at all that's something that i really discovered through uh through birding so you might be curious well where did all of this begin. So let me set the stage for you. I was in my mid 30s going through a career transition. I had just left behind a job in Missouri where I was teaching Russian literature and I was back in Toronto. And so I was in this career transition and I was kind of auditioning hobbies. I was searching for something that would make me feel at peace and at the same time something that would exercise my patience and also provide me with intellectual stimulation and all of that, you know, without having to do yoga and get into downward dog or something. So I was auditioning hobbies and I tried everything from pottery to bookmaking to improv classes, you name it, I, tr I tried it. And then I read this essay by Jonathan Franzen in The New Yorker, and the essay was called My Bird Problem. And you know, initially I was just drawn to the essay because I thought the title was so weird. Like, what is this bird problem he has? And the essay is about how he uh, was introduced to birding and how birding made him a more optimistic person and made him care about the world in totally different ways. And by the end of the essay, I was so curious about this world. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, maybe I need a bird problem of my own. Maybe that's gonna solve my midlife crisis. And so I went, um, you know, I Googled bird watching group Toronto uh, and found a birding group and went out with them uh, for the first uh, for the first time. And initially, what kind of sparked my interest wasn't the birds themselves, because I knew nothing about birds. The only thing I knew was that pigeons existed. So I wasn't in it for the birds themselves. I was really curious about the birders. Like, who were these people who wore multi-pocketed vests and who talked about optics? So that was kind of why I decided to join this group. And then something completely unexpected happened. I saw this bird. This is the red-winged blackbird. This is probably, you know, one of the most common uh, spring migrants, the harbinger of spring. Um, this is not an exotic bird at all, but for somebody who knew nothing about birds, this particular bird made me stop dead in my tracks and just stare at it and wonder, oh my God, you know, what have I been missing all this time? So I'm just gonna read a short passage 
from my book, which is about that very first day when I saw my red wing, red wing blackbird, because this is really the moment that kind of cracked my world open and that showed me how much there is in the world that I had totally been ignoring up until this point. This was really the moment that um, kind of delineated the before from the after, right? Julia before birds to Julia after birds. Um, so let me let me read a little bit from my book. I had no trouble recognizing the group in the parking lot cargo pants tucked into socks and signature off-white multi-pocketed vests, which I recognized from the times I had Googled bird watchers. Each of the half dozen people huddled around their cars and wore at least one item of bird themed clothing, ranging from a subtle baseball cap with a woodpecker on it to a more boisterous sweatshirt featuring a giant red bird with black wings. So bright, I wondered for a minute if the bird could be real. I looked around for the leader while I tried to make sense of their optics talk. Questions about magnification and optical quality of vortex versus eagle eye passed me by completely. But I understood enough to nod in appreciation when Lucy, a petite retired high school teacher, showed off her recently purchased high-end Swarovski binoculars. She later admitted with a mischievous smile that she had bought them with money she'd set aside for a sofa. I knew the leader had arrived once a rusty Toyota pulled up and everybody said, there's Brett. A six foot tall high school math and science teacher, Brett wore sweatpants with a Norwegian knit sweater and a baseball cap with yet another bird on it. Initially stern, his face lit up when he said, I read a pretty good report this morning. Let's head to Kipling Spit. And although the references to a report and to Kipling Spit uh, were completely lost on me, I introduced myself, reminded him of the email I had sent a few days earlier and sheepishly admitted that I was a complete beginner. Not to worry, folks in our group have varying degrees of experience. I mean, there isn't a single person here who can ID all the warblers. Uh, a warbler? I knew ducks and pigeons and owls existed, but what were warblers? Wow, he said, you weren't kidding when you said beginner. Nope, do you have binoculars? I shook my head. That might be a good place to start, said Brett with a chuckle, which I thought might be code for, who is this interloper? How did she find me on the internet? And why on earth did I ever email her back when she clearly said she knew not a thing about birds? Once we got into our respective cars, our cavalcade of birders thundered down the highway until we reached a park at the foot of Kipling Avenue, where the city meets Lake Ontario, and where, according to the report Brett had read on Aunt Birds, a Western grebe had recently been seen. A kind gentleman named Benito, draped in a long lensed camera and binoculars, and with a spotting scope casually resting on his shoulder, let me borrow his spare pair of binoculars, which he alternately called his bins, or binocs, or glasses. They were heavy around my neck. As we walked out to the lake, people started shouting words I couldn't process. Northern shoveler! Red-breasted merganser, American widgeon, bufflehead, long-tailed duck. The binoculars wobbled in my hands. High winds accosted me, and when I tried to focus the lenses, my eyes watered. The second I glimpsed a duck, it dove and left me staring at the hyperactive early April waves on Lake Ontario. Wait, look, Brett shouted. I think I got it. Horn grebe, horn grebe over there, next to the pie build grebe. You can't miss it, to the right of the dozens. Oh my God, no, hundreds of redneck grebes out there. Wait, is that a Western grebe? Are you seeing the grebes, Julia? It's not every day you get four species in one place. My mind bobbed in and out of awareness amidst this sea of names. I nodded, but my binoculars were pointed at the CN Tower, the only thing I could safely identify on the horizon. What's a grebe? 
Start with the redneck greaves, Brett replied. They are clo there are close to 500 of them out there. You can't miss them, gorgeous rust-colored neck. And look at that elongated bill. It's a textbook grebe, no doubt about it. I located the mass of waterfowl, but in the dull light, I couldn't detect anything remotely rust-colored and all the bills looked identical to my untrained eye. On our way back to the cars, my extremities frozen from standing still in gale-like winds, I wondered how many more hours of staring at dark blobs on the water I could withstand. Disenchanted, I was preparing my exit speech to the group when we stopped near a bush and someone called out, Red Wing Blackbird. I almost didn't look because the thought of lifting the binoculars to my eyes brought with it a slight wave of nausea. But the bird stood still, balancing on a cattail, and I managed the trifecta of raising the binoculars, focusing them, and finding the desired object magnified in my field of vision. What is that? I gasped nearly blinded by the unexpected vermilion patches on the blackbird's epaulets. I watched as the bird threw back its head, opened wide its beak, and let out a sound so primal it left me marveling. This was as close as I'd ever come to dinosaurs. If this bird had been there all along, I thought, what else had I been missing? And that really, that was the absolutely transformative thing. You know, when I saw this red winged blackbird, I asked my bird leader if this was a rare migrant from Peru. I mean, I really, I was really a blank slate. I knew nothing about birds. You know, there are some people who say, um, you know, who are very humble, who call themselves beginner birders, but what they Oh, hi, Julia, can you hear me? Uh. And when Brett told me that this is one of the most common spring birds in Southern Ontario, I really did, you know, wonder what else have I been missing here in my hometown. And what's interesting is that before I started birding, I really thought that in order to see nature, you had to go far away from the city, that there was no nature in the city. I just thought of Toronto as this, um, you know, kind of concrete jungle. And slowly as I started birding, um, not only did I change my way of looking at the world, but actually the city that I lived in was also transformed from this concrete jungle into a network of wildernesses. And um, that was really a fascinating, fascinating awakening for me as well, that really, you know, nature is everywhere all around us. All we have to do is stop and look. And that was such a radical shift in uh, in my thinking because you know all my life I thought that I have decent vision like with glasses and I, I thought I knew how to see and when I started birding I realized that no I I hadn't been looking like you know for 35 years of my life I I have not been looking properly so um, that is you know another way in which uh, in which birds changed me. Um, and so I mentioned that my book is not ornithology. I am first and foremost, uh, I'm first and foremost a writer. And this is one of my all time favorite birds, the cedar waxwing. And I love them for their hairdos uh, among, among many, many other things. And in her, in her awesome int um, introduction, Julie mentioned that this book, you know, in addition to being um, 
about how I fell in love with birds. The book also charts uh, the, the trajectory of how I, as a nature novice, how I discovered my wild side. And there's a chapter in my book where I really try to find my wild side by volunteering for um, Project Puffin in the United States. I, I went to Maine for a week and lived on this island with no electricity. It was completely off grid and uh, volunteered with, with a group of um, field biologists studying uh, terns, uh, lease terns, common terns, arctic terns, studying, doing breeding um, turn surveys. And initially I thought, oh my goodness, this, this is exactly what I want to do. But after spending a week um, in very, very adverse weather conditions, spending a week in a wet tent, I realized, okay, maybe, maybe that's not the kind of wild side I, I'm really looking for. And what I realized um, is that my my wild side is located right here in downtown Toronto at the bird banding station where I volunteer. Um, and so I've been work volunteering at this bird banding station for about six years now. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't grow up with nature, didn't grow up with pets. So it actually took me a couple years to uh, become brave enough to handle a bird myself and to actually hold a cedar waxwing in my hand and here am I, here I am. This is uh, the first time that I extracted a, a bird from a mist net and actually held the cedar waxwing in my hand. And a lot of the volunteers asked me like, why are you here? What are you doing here? And I said, you know, this is, this is bravery school for me. This is, uh, you know, I'm trying something new. This is me discovering my wild side. So here, here I am with, uh, with the cedar waxwing. Uh, one of the birds that I really believe has one of the best avian hairdos ever. And I'm just going to read a passage about that hairdo. I first saw a cedar waxwing, Bombacilla cedrorum, in Luther Marsh, a few hours north of Toronto. It has a black eye mask, almost as if it's wearing a fetching pair of Ray-Bans and a slick cinnamon gravity-defying crest on its head. Its style is not as ostentatious as a northern cardinal's, which basically screams, look at me, look at me now, but it is still full of grace and even something beyond grace. It wasn't one cedar waxwing that we saw, but a flock that alighted on different branches of the same tree. And I was immediately struck by the bird's effortless yet perfect hairdos. This is a bird that never has to stand in front of the mirror, wondering whether moose or gel or some sort of pomade will do the trick. And finally, abandoning all three overpriced options in favor of a ponytail or better yet, a hair clip. This is a bird without hair issues. This is a bird I would love to be. And as I, as I mentioned, the cedar waxwing was the first bird that I held in my hand and the first bird that I managed to extract from a, uh, from a mist net. So I'm just going to read you that passage. A number, a number of years later, when I started volunteering at a bird banding station and began my treacherous journey toward learning how to extract birds from the lightweight mist nets, I held a cedar waxwing in my hand. Not only that, but I managed to extract the bird from the net, which turned out to be easier than I had assumed since it wasn't tangled and it simply slid out. Nervously, I held the waxwing in Bander's grip with the head snug between my index and middle fingers and the rest of the bird's body in my cupped hand. I could feel the bird's heartbeat knocking against my shaking hand. I knew the wax wings, I knew wax wings had silky plumage, hence their genus Bombacilla, which derives from the Latin for silkworm, but I gasped at the softness of the bird's feathers. It wasn't just that they were soft, they were miraculously soft, something almost otherworldly, like sensing an unexpected kinship, reaching toward a hand that suddenly felt familiar. Just as I suspected, 
sorry, just as I inspected the bird's hairdo up close and marveled at my superhuman feat of actually handling the bird, holding it in my hands without killing it, the cedar waxwing spat up three plump red berries, one of which semi-masticated um, stained my khakis. So for my, so, so, sorry, so much for the resplendent beauty of nature. There is absolutely nothing cute passive or demure about birds, soft, silky plumage notwithstanding. So that just gives you a sense of my first physical interaction with a bird. And volunteering at the, at the bird banding station in downtown Toronto really also changed my relationship with birds because holding a bird in your hand, you really sense the fragility of these uh, migratory birds. And you also, it's, it's really a magical moment because you start to marvel at, um, at the bird's determination and at their intrepid nature uh, and at their, at their phenomenal resilience because these migratory journeys they undertake are so completely uh, perilous. So it was really an absolutely eye-opening experience for me. Um, and here I am also at the banding station. The image on the left is me holding a black and white warbler, which is the first warbler I could identify. So it still holds a very, very warm place in my heart. And uh, the image on the right uh, is me holding a buffle head. And you can, you can see that in all of these pictures of me with birds, I am so happy. And one of, um, you know, one of the big kind of central through lines of my book is that um, not only did birds make me see in a different way, but birds just made me so completely happy. And I was absolutely thrilled this winter when there were a few scientific papers published in Germany that actually provided scientific evidence to the argument I was making that yes, birds make us happy. And the scientific papers said that seeing a greater diversity of birds gives people more life satisfaction. In fact, the, the satisfaction we derive from seeing a greater diversity of birds is on par with the satisfaction we derive from, uh, you know, uh, from, from money, from, um, and so that to me is, it, it's wonderful, wonderful proof. And I feel like my book should now have a little sticker on it that says scientifically proven. So yes, birds make us happy. And I think we've all noticed that, especially during the pandemic. Um, you know, I wrote an article for the Globe and Mail back uh, in the early days of the pandemic last, uh, last May when everything was shut down and everything was canceled. And I said, you know, the only thing that isn't canceled right now is migration. The birds aren't canceled. And I said that this pandemic is turning everybody into unintentional birders. And, you know, it's interesting because at first uh, it was just like anecdotal evidence. I would hear things about uh, you know, about, about people enjoying nature and looking to birds and, you know, going birding for the first time. But then the Cornell Lab of Ornithology released their statistics for their citizen science project, eBird, which is when people can report bird sightings. And um, in April and May of last year, so in the early days of the pandemic, eBird sightings shot up 30%. So it isn't just anecdotal. People were turning to birds and are still turning to birds during, during this pandemic. And part of the pleasure, I think, of watching birds is that it's a hobby that forces us to step outside of ourselves and outside of our own minds. And the beautiful thing about birds is that they don't, they don't care about us. They don't care about our petty problems. They don't care about COVID. Um, so it's really a chance to step outside of yourself and um, 
I think that that in and of itself is extremely healthy. And also watching birds is such a fascinating uh, exercise because birds and bird behavior are very, very strange and unusual and absolutely fascinating to observe. And if you have a backyard with a backyard feeder, just watching the social dynamics that play out at your backyard feeder, oh my goodness, that will bring you right back to uh, you know the high school cafeteria dynamics. Like you have the queen bees and the wannabes and um, all sorts of different personalities that emerge. And then there's always like a Cooper's hawk uh, waiting just lurking and trying to check out the buffet and to see who he could pounce on. So watching birds is also tremendously entertaining. And I think people really found solace in that um, during, especially during the pandemic. And another thing about birds is that they're free. They can roam wherever they want, right? Birds don't know borders and they also don't know COVID. And while we are cooped up and it feels like our worlds are shrinking, um, birds are completely free. And I think that also uh, brings us a certain amount of solace. So especially during the pandemic, we've seen people turn to birds for inspiration, for comfort, uh, for all sorts of reasons. And um, those are also, you know, a lot of the things that I fell in love with when I first started birding and which I write about uh, in my book. And to me, birds really are an antidote to, uh, to despair. Um, that's, that's really how, how I see it. Um, and specifically because they force you to be present and to really be in the moment. And I think that that's another really, really important life lesson that I derived from, from birding as well. And another amazing thing about birds is that, um, you know, birds are also an antidote to smugness because anybody who watches birds um, and who loves birds will make mistakes. Like birding is in and of itself, um, it has taught me to become comfortable with failure. I always joke that birding is sort of my apprenticeship to, uh, to failure. And in the beginning, in the beginning days of my birding journey, I used to get so upset every time I would misidentify a bird. And I'm, you know, I make colossal uh, mis uh, missteps in this book. And I, I wrote about the time when I accidentally um, misidentified a, a, a green heron and instead I called it a hummingbird and I mean that was just such a radical um, just a colossal mistake and after that you know I, I contemplated quitting birding I'm like oh my god what is what is the point if I'm making mistakes like that but slowly over the course of my birding journey I started to see that these mistakes and these misidentifications they were opportunities for learning and every serious birder will say, well, mis misidentifications, that is just a part of my process. Mistakes are a part of my process because you don't, you can't learn um, that, you know, you can't correctly identify a bird until you have ruled out everything that it isn't. So until you have made all those misidentifications. And that to me was also tremendously, uh, tremendously illuminating. So birding really teaches you to be comfortable with, with making mistakes. And that was such an important lesson for me to learn as a kind of type A personality, very goal-oriented uh, goal oriented person. Um, and here is, uh, this is one of my favorite photos. This is what we call a warbler party at the banding station. This is during uh, fall migration. So we're holding up a bunch of warblers. You can see magnolia warblers, black-throated blue, uh, perula, perula warblers. And, um, you know, the more I learned about migration, both through my own reading and through volunteering at the bird banding at the migration monitoring station, the more I started to think about my own family stories and about who I was. And I realized that on some level, 
I am a migratory species as well. Like my family, you know, I mentioned we emigrated from the Soviet Union. We came to Canada in the late 70s. But even before my family came to the Soviet Union, it's almost like this migratory instinct is in my DNA because I come from my family is Jewish. And so during the Second World War, uh, you know, my grandparents were evacuated from um, from Ukraine, where they lived, to the far east uh, of the Soviet Union. And even before the Second World War, my ancestors were constantly moving around because there were so many pogroms at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So it's almost like um, the more I got to know birds, the more I started to identify with them a little bit and to see echoes of my own life within these birds. And so, you know, I mentioned that I, I am not a scientist. I am not an ornithologist. And in fact, I commit one of the cardinal uh, sins, um, the cardinal scientific sin, is that I anthropomorphize. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to see personal connections between my life story and these birds and, and what we're going through. And in a way that process of identifying with the birds made me fall in love with them even more and really um, you know, made me committed to caring about them, caring for them and to using my writerly voice um, as, as a way to uh, you know, bring awareness to um, climate change and all of these problems that the birds are that birds are facing today. Birds need us right now as much as we need them. And that I think is a really, really important, um, important thing to recognize. And to me, birding, the more I got to know birds, the more I really started seeing birding as it's an act of care. It's an act of empathy. And I think getting to know birds closely and observing them closely and really paying attention to nuance um, made me a much more empathetic, uh, empathetic person in a way. So here is another image of me as a photo of me at the bird banding station. And when my book came out, it got quite a bit of press uh, in the Toronto Star. And there was an interview published with me in the Star. And the editor had asked for some photos of me in, in my birdie element. And I sent the editor all these nice photos of me with birds, the stuff you've seen. And then I sent her this photo as a joke. <laughs> And this is the photo that ended up like in a full page of the Toronto Star. Um, this, this, is, this is me at the banding station sort of demonstrating, uh, you know, bird banding chic fashion. And uh, this photo was taken uh, a couple, I think about three or four years ago, when the water level in Lake Ontario rose perilously high, and there was a lot of flooding. And so we had to wear hip waders. But I am still smiling here uh, in spite of the, uh, of, the, of the hip waders. So, you know, this, this book is really about how birds gave me a new lease on life when, when I needed it most. And they really helped me out of my midlife crisis. And they also really, um, they helped me kind of understand that life takes all sorts of twists and turns until I, um, until I found birds, I had been very, very committed to one particular path. And part of my midlife crisis sort of revolved around the fact that my life wasn't turning out the way I had planned it. Um, and, you know, I came to the realization in my late 30s that I would not become a mother. And so there were there were all sorts of, of issues um, that I, I was dealing with. And I think having birds as as an anchor and um, you know what what birding also teaches you is to really embrace spontaneity because in birding you can only plan so much like you know every time I go out birding I have a target list of things I would like to see but the magic of birds is they fly <laughs> and that you can have the best intentions and the best plans and things might not work out 
the way you had planned. But what birding did show me is that very often, you know, like today, for instance, I wanted to see a Canada warbler. I went to Colonel Sam Smith Park and I stood there for two and a half hours trying to find a Canada warbler. There was not a Canada warbler to be found. And right when I was leaving, a bay-breasted warbler just flew into my line of vision. And you know what? That was even better than the Canada warbler at that particular moment. So birding really taught me to let go of some of my plans and expectations and to embrace spontaneity a little bit more. And it really helped me as, uh, as a writer as well as, um, as a person. Um, here's another photo of me at the bird banding station. I'm always smiling when I'm there because that is where I'm happiest. And I just wanted to show you this photo because it really gives you a sense of, um, you know, the city, Toronto, sort of transforming through my love of birds. So birding really gave me a new vantage point, um, a new vantage point on, uh, on the city as well. Um, Let's see. So people often ask me what my favorite bird is. And that's a hard question. And the more I've been birding, the more, the more I, you know, basically my favorite bird is usually whatever bird I'm looking at. Because another thing birding has taught me is to really pay attention to what's in front of you. Very, very often um, we try to turn the bird we're looking at into something else, right? But um, what, I, what I learned over time is that the most important thing is to get to know that bird that's in front of you and not to try to turn it into something else. And curiously enough, that is also one of the best lessons I learned about love as well. And there's a, there's a chapter in this book about um, everything birds taught me about love. And that was one of the biggest lessons. Pay attention to the person in front of you uh, as they are and not as you wish they were. Um, so anyway, here is an image of a photo of an American woodcock. And this is possibly one of the strangest birds I have ever encountered. And it is one of my absolute favorites. So I'm just going to read you a paragraph from my book. If I could get a bird inked on my body, it would be the American woodcock, the largest North American shorebird, which hangs out mostly on damp ground in the woods, perfectly camouflaged with its surroundings. To me, the bird looks like an accident of nature. Its eyes grotesquely close together, perched high up on its head, giving it almost 360 degrees of vision for detecting predators and a long ultra sensitive bill for probing the ground for worms that it cannot see. Stocky, short-legged, incessantly pouting, this is a bird with attitude. And yet the American woodcock is also one of the more curious Don Juans of the avian world. In early spring, at dusk, the bird engages in an aerial mating dance that counts among the more peculiar things I have ever seen. It begins with a nasal peent, repeated more time than strictly necessary. And if a nasal note weren't enough to get a girl going, what follows is nothing short of spectacular. The pouty, stocky woodcock hurls himself high into the ether on whistling wings, ascending in a series of wide circles as if he had suddenly developed the agility of a nymph. Then he plummets to the ground with a yelp and does the acrobatic feat all over again. These peints and aerial dances work like a charm in the spring. The American woodcock mates morning and night without fail for eight straight weeks. What female wouldn't be seduced by such a show? After witnessing the stocky bird's transformation into an aerial gymnast, even I could be convinced to mate with a woodcock. 
So there you go. And just a couple, a couple more images. This is uh, this is a snowy owl, which my friend Danny Miles photographed uh, in Tommy Thompson Park in downtown Toronto. And this just goes to show you that nature is all around us, and you don't have to go far to appreciate it. And here, once again, another vantage point on the city that I have come to love uh, through birds. I still can't wait to travel once we're done with COVID, but I, I definitely, I, I appreciate everything we have in the city so much more. And I just wanted to share a couple really um, uh, important quotations that were important for me in the writing of this book and also important for me in my journey as, uh, as a birder. And this is from Ken Kaufman's classic Kingbird Highway. And he wrote, I resolve to look at birds more carefully from now on, to look at all of them, common or rare, to see if I could really get to know them. It was the beginning of my e the end of my interest in listing. And when I first started birding, my goal was to see a rarity, right? To be that A plus student who found the rare bird. And what I realized over time is that that's not a great way of birding. The point of birding is to get to know the birds, whether they're common or rare, and to get to know all of them. Um, the point isn't listing, the point is establishing a connection. Um, and of course, the more you see, the more you wanna see, and the more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. And the second quote is from a wonderful little book called How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher. And what Simon Barnes really showed me is that there is no one way to be a birder. In this book, I write about how I had a little bit of an identity crisis when I was trying to figure out, well, what kind of birder am I? Am I the person who sits in her backyard and just appreciates what comes to her? Or am I the person who twitches, right? Who jumps in my car the minute I learn that there's a rarity and chases birds? What kind of birder am I? Um, and I realized that there are so many different ways to be a birder and there's no right way and Simon Barnes writes bird watching is a state of being and not an activity it is about life and it is about living it is the habit of looking and really that is what I've been cultivating the habit of looking and that is how birding has really become a part of my day-to-day -day life and finally I'm just going to end the presentation by saying that I think birding has made me into a more optimistic person. And this is, um, this is some of my favorite graffiti uh, here in Toronto. There is a graffiti artist who runs around the city. I don't know who this person is and writes, everything is possible, tout est possible. And that is what birding has given me, just this sense of possibility. It has made the world bigger. It has expanded, literally expanded my horizons. And I really believe that birding, uh, you know, it is, it's an act of optimism and an act of hope. So I'm going to end on that note and I welcome any questions you have. And thank you. Thank you so much. All right. If you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll read them out loud to, to Julia. I think we already have at least one. All right, uh, so question. How will you evolve when you get past all the success and the high profile of being enjoyed uh, by field notes from an unintentional burger? Um, just a second. How, how will you evolve in Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you know, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I feel like I, as a, as a birder, I am still constantly evolving. Like it's spring migration right now. And I am being humbled every single day uh, that I'm out in the field. So I really believe, and I write about this in my book, that um, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong beginner when it comes to birding. And one of, one of the great gifts that birding has, has given me is that it has shown me that I don't have to be a super birder to still enjoy it, 
right? I don't have to be the best birder in the group. I don't have to strive for that. Really what I'm cultivating is, as Simon Barnes says, a habit of looking. Um, so I feel like I am still constantly evolving in terms of my knowledge and my familiarity with, with birds. And it is, it's a, you know, it's a work in progress always, and especially when it comes to bird songs, which are so challenging. Um, and the thing about birds is there are 10,000 species in the world. I, I will never stop evolving. <laughs> so one question. Um, yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Julie, if you have any questions for Julia, No, I don't. Um, uh, it looks like someone. It's like a question. We're getting here. we're getting a couple uh, comments uh, more so than questions. Um, a lifelong beginner is a good thing. I aspire to that to the state. Oh, thank you, thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> uh, we got another. Uh, you dedicate the book uh, to your husband and to. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce this. Um, Brown oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Deal. Mm -hmm. um, a very touching part of the book is how fleeting life um, is as caused by the death of uh, Miss Dazeal. Um, how do you feel about rescuing a bird that has fallen out of a nest? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning that, JC. Yeah, I do. I do dedicate this book to um, a good friend of mine from the bird banding station who uh, tragically died um, at a very, very young age. She was a I think 24, 24, 24 years old. Um, and shortly before her death, we, um, you know, she, she took me out and we went snowy owl banding, which was one of one of the best days of, of my life. And so her death was like all the more shocking. And I, I try to process that in, uh, in that chapter. Uh, how do you feel about rescuing a bird that has fallen out of a nest? Um, that that's interesting. You know, I don't know too much about bird bird rescue um I, like i i i think what you, what you the most important thing you need to do well, apart from calling the wildlife service is just um make make sure that the bird isn't stunned right just kind of cover cover it up and then i would i would call trained professionals to help you out with that um some you know some birds respond very badly to that some bir some birds are okay with that like owls fall out of nests and they can be put back in so it depends on uh it depends on the strength of of the birds but i don't i don't know too much about that um, um, I would just defer to an expert. Uh, Pat asks, where is your banding station on the Toronto Islands? Um, so the banding station is actually not on Toronto Island. It is in Toronto proper. There is a park that is a peninsula called the Leslie Street Spit, Tommy Thompson Park. And the banding station is in that, on that peninsula in that park. Um, yeah, so it's it's crazy that it's in downtown Toronto and most people don't don't even know it's there. <laughs> um, Anne says, I love how you combine writing and bird watching. What writers have inspired you to write in this way? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful question, Anne. So I, I am very inspired by Jonathan Franzen. Um, he both his his um, his nonfiction about birds, especially, and also the way he manages to weave birds into his fiction. I was also really inspired by H is for Hawk by Helen, uh, Helen McDonald. Mm -hmm. I, um, I thought that book was uh, absolutely fascinating in term, both in terms of how she wove her life um, into uh, and sort of her life experience with this goshawk that she trained and also how she shares her personal like grief um, at you know dealing with her her father's death so those those are two really important writers uh, for me and there's a lot of fantastic uh, bird writing um, there's a Canadian 
author Kyle McClear, who wrote a wonderful book called Birds Art Life. And her book is about how she becomes a birder for one year. It was sort of like an experiment um, as she is caring for her ailing father, um, who is very, very ill. So she's balancing, balancing caregiving with this new hobby that is making her feel more and more alive. And the birding actually um, sort of gives her a new perspective on what it means to be a writer and an artist at large. So those are those are three kind of authors that uh, that come to mind. Um, oh, and of course Ken Kaufman, wh whom I mentioned, and this wonderful writer. Um, she was actually more birder than a writer, Phoebe Snetzinger. She really, really inspires uh, inspires me. She was the first woman to see eight thousand species in uh, in the in the eighties. She was an extraordinary birder and just an extraordinary extraordinary woman. Like you know, she was raised in the nineteen fifties. Uh, she was a housewife and she saw her first bird when she was thirty five years old, kind of just like me. Except she saw a blackbirdian warbler, which is a lot more special than a red winged blackbird. But nonetheless, that that just that set off a spark in her um, and she became completely obsessed uh, actually a little bit too obsessed for my taste but she's such a her life story is absolutely fascinating and um, and inspiring as well a uh, question from JC uh, where will you travel first to bird when you can travel freely again oh my goodness that is something I fantasize about constantly. And I feel like the destination changes every day. Um, I would like to go back to New Jersey, uh, to Cape May, New Jersey, partly because it's an easy road trip. Um, and also because last time I was in Cape May, New Jersey, we were there for six days. And every single day over the course of those six days, I tried to see a blue gross beak. And everywhere we went, people said, oh, it just flew. Oh, you're two minutes late, it just flew. So I need to see that blue headed gross beak. <laughs> Um, you know, in my book, I write about um, spark birds, of course, which I've talked about today, and also nemesis birds, right? The bird that keeps escaping you and that keeps eluding you. And my nemesis bird used to be the pileated woodpecker. And then I saw it. And there was this moment when I saw the pileated woodpecker where I was so happy. I was like ecstatic. I nearly started crying. I was screaming. It was this moment. And then shortly after that, maybe 30 seconds later, suddenly I was gripped with this fierce sadness. And I was like, oh no, what now? Because the saddest thing in the world is not to have a nemesis bird. <laughs> so now I have a collection of nemesis birds, but blue gross beak is up there. It's like number one on my list right now. I also really want to go back to Israel at some point and when it's safe to do so, uh, because that is a fantastic bird destination. Like all the migrants come up from Africa and then it's, it's on a flyway. So they do kind of diverge half go to Central Asia and the rest go up to Europe. So that was a that's a fascinating place. I'd love. And Central America. My goodness, those colors. We just don't get birds that colorful. So a lot of places. <laughs> Sounds like you're going to need to do a across the world trip right after yeah, everything oh opens goodness. up. Just take off five months, travel the world, <laughs> see some birds. Um, I'll give it one more minute in case anyone has any last minute questions for Julia. Um, and then we'll just get, if, Ju if Julie wants to wrap up, say any, anything uh, to end. Mm -hmm. I feel like playing the, the Jeopardy theme song right now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, Julia, if you, if you want to close this out, that'd be great. Okay. Well, Julia, that was wonderful. I mean, that, that was just fantastic. I, I kept writing down things it's, that, that resonated with me and I'm sure with everyone else. Uh, where you talked about life taking all kinds of twists and turns and, and how birding helped to ground you. And that, I, I think, especially this year, we can all relate to that. Um, the whole thing about 
birding being a state of being and a habit of looking, you know, I'm going to be thinking about that for quite some time. I think that's really very profound. Um, and being a lifelong beginner, I think, I think that's not just birding, but I think that's something that we should all aspire to in various areas. Um, I mean, that's, I think that's what life is about. And, and so, um, I have dozens more things that you said that I could re repeat. You, you did a wonderful job on this. It was so interesting. And I know everyone's going to be thinking about it for some time for being here tonight and for giving us all lots of things to think about and be inspired by. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was really such a pleasure. Great. Uh, thanks everyone for coming it's coming really out fun. and uh, have a have a great night. Bye. 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 Bye.